So we have one amazing speaker that uh, Panacha and I were able to pre-record with yesterday, and we're going to play that session now. Uh, it's Dr. Mark Sager, the co-founder and CEO of Soul Machines. And at Soul Machines, his team is developing autonomously animated virtual humans with virtual brains and nervous systems capable of highly expressive face-to-face -face interaction and real-time learning. Uh, through their work pioneering new technologies that realistically embody biologically based models of neural networks and neural systems with highly expressive faces, Soul Machine plans to redefine human and artificial intelligence interactions uh, and transform our lives. Their work is truly astounding. It's unbelievable. Uh, I have been so impressed by Mark and, and his team and some of the amazing explorations he's dealing with as he tries to think of this theme of artificial intelligence and artificial consciousness in some ways. He's also well known for his ability to create real life, lifelike animations, winning awards for his pioneering work in computer generated faces in films such as Avatar and King Kong, with, where his work has often stood at the intersection of creativity and science. I'm thrilled that we're able to share his work here the conference today. Uh, so we're going to show one video now and then just jump into the pre-recorded session we did with him yesterday and you'll get to see it firsthand. Thank you. Mark, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us today, and thank you so much for doing this. Uh, as you know, I've, I've uh, witnessed and seen a lot of the work you're doing at Soul Machine, and I continue to be so inspired by just the amazing amount of you know, human ingenuity you've done to create something that will you know, undoubtedly lead to a new generation of technological ingenuity. And you know, I'd love if you can share the vision first you had about coming from the world of you know, one, which I think is special effects, VFX, and learning so much about the nonverbal communication of that. And then, you know, how you wanted to take that into Soul Machines and the distinctions you have in trying to create what is obviously with Baby X and everything else, uh, you know, a real game changer, potentially, in how we interact with virtual beings. Um, so the uh, my background um, before that was in um, bioengineering. So I was interested in, in building, sort of, uh, I guess, mathematical models of of physiology, and I'd always been interested in the in the brain and consciousness, and and in basically human behaviour, and so in the as as I um I, in my PhD on that I then moved into basically simulating human faces, and and that ended up sort of you know ended up working in the um you know special effects industry doing you know faces for things like Avatar and King Kong, and I was really interested in in how, you know, in capturing what actors would do in order to basically perform so that you actually thought that they had a inner life, you know, that there was there was a, a, a form of, you know, thinking going on in there and and feeling because ultimately that's what's connecting to the audience. So, but that's a bit like transcribing music. So you're recording what the actor does, working out the notes that they are, they are creating because they're creating a symphony and then you're transcribing that onto a digital character and so but the thing which really fascinated me is how are those notes composed how does the symphony compose how do we compose our own facial symph um, symphonies when we're interacting with each other and and so the I started a lab to explore this where we we're taking models of brain models like cognitive models and models of um, how the the brain basically drives the muscles and the face and the body and building a, a system which animated from the inside out 
So it was basically a system which is animated and it's, it's autonomous in its, in its actions, and it's driven by the same sort of factors that drive us. Well, massively simplified models of those, but nevertheless trying to address all the factors which actually, you know, touch human behavior. And, and so that was the real sort of inspiration to, to do this, was to try to create a you know, computer that could, that could imagine, that could feel in some sense, and dream, and do the types of things that, that we do that we well, find. And I want to jump in there, because really, anyone who sees the work is so amazed by how far you've gone. But are you really, is it a scenario where it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and talks, you know, and seems like a duck, but it is very different or are you really trying to achieve some level of trying to create, you know, an artificial superintelligence or some level of consciousness? Uh, and do you believe that is even possible? Yeah. So I don't know whether it's possible, and that's the thing. But I think it's one of the most fascinating journeys to go on. So to me, it's one of the consciousness, for example, is one of the greatest mysteries in the universe. And so, just trying to go forward on that journey and is in itself incredibly fascinating and because it because the in building simulations you really have to break everything down into into pieces to to um, you know to make them all work together but in that process you start discovering what you don't know right. so you know for example like neuroscience is, is is an incredible field but we only know like the tip of the iceberg in terms of what really makes us tick there's lots of theories out there and so we kind of take some of these theories and and put them together and and try to make the system work with that but it's it's a it's like a a functioning sketch of of sort of current thinking of how these these systems kind of work together and so there's you know there's a, it's and, and a the neural nets you're building is really trying to emulate how we as or how human beings as children would learn how how the human progress is going correct is that yeah. is that the differentiation and how you've approached really the entire aspects of, of what's all yes machines? yes so so one of the key things that we we really focus on um so soul machines as a company we, we we've got the baby x project which is really about about exploring that and then we have a uh, the sort of more adult digital humans that we create which are virtual assistants and things like that and and that's more um that's more sort of orchestrated you know say for example they're that you, you're basically telling them what to say. They're not thinking that for themselves so much. Whereas the whereas the um, auton the the real autonomous work we're doing is is to have a computer which actually experiences things in the same sort of ways that we do. So it learns through experience and through interaction. Now, where these come together is the key thing that we're trying to explore is the nature of human cooperation. Because you know, human cooperation is the most powerful force in history. It's what's you know created medicine, put people on the moon. You know, all these amazing types of things that that people have done, and and but it's because people are working together on this. You know, people these are brains working together. So where does that start, right? So it starts right at the beginning when you're a baby and your your caregiver, your parents' caregiver. Uh, uh, teaching you and interacting and, and you're, you're becoming you, you're, the social learning going on. So everything that you're learning is, is as a result of this sort of interaction. Now, if we're going to interact with intelligent machines in the future, we need to have that same sort of sort of socialization, that same sort of flow that, that we have with other people, especially when we're cooperating, because if we can cooperate with intelligent machines, then that will define the next era of history. So how, how I mean, when you get to that level, though, is there, I mean, how do you debate the ethics that you're thinking about as a company, too? Because, you know, at some point, you could get to a point where a human being has a deeper relationship with an artificial being than he could ever have in any human context, because that artificial being could study that person and optimize an engagement for that person better almost than any human could ever do. Also by understanding so many other people and putting that algorithm into place. And we've seen you know, the dangerous side of this with social media companies and others when things are just optimized for engagement. Uh, you know, is there a concern? Is there a fear, you know, as you think about the genie you're unleashing in the world? So 
I think there's you know there's lots of lots of things there. So so on one level, I think it's incredibly important that people are in the loop. That these we're building machines for us, not to control us. Yeah. So so the um, you know the the other thing that you touched on um, was. Was the um, I forgot was sorry you asked me about three things. Could you mind yeah. repeating? Well, one is the, the ethical component. Of this right, yeah. what keeps you up at night on that? And is there a fear that you're going to get to a point where you know these these virtual beings will be able to maximize engagement on us in a way that no human being ever could? Ah, so yeah, yeah. So so now arguably no machine could ever understand human suffering without being a human. So th this is a thing, is if you search the internet and you read all the articles, right, you're still not going to understand what it is to suffer as a person without actually going through that. And, and so when we relate to other people, we're relating about our experiences in the world as a human. And so, so this is a thing where I don't think you could ever get that sort of empathy from a machine. However, you could have a machine which can acknowledge that, hmm. that you feel a particular way, and then address that in, in a way which we know to be beneficial. So, so these are things like, for example, you know, if you're lonely, you know, make a plan to go, in, to go outside, make a plan to smile at somebody, make a plan to talk to somebody during the day. So these are the types of things where I think these are, these are they're, they're, it's curated in a way. Now, so I think that, you know, there's, there's levels and levels of this, but we take the ethics of it very seriously. So, you know, we don't want to create systems which fool people. So we deliberately say, you know, I'm not a real person. And the other thing is, is that, um, you know, you, you, sh you don't want to create any dependencies. So you, you, you don't want to have a situation where a person becomes dependent on an artificial companion. So it's, I think these are very important things to keep in mind. And like, for example, right now, you know, uh, lots of people have a very unhealthy relationship with social media. They're stuck on their, their devices without going and talking to real people and having these real interactions. So, so um, you know, my relationship with technology has always been a love hate technology because I love nature so much that I don't want to be stuck on a device. I want to be interacting with people and nature. And so, but technology has all these incredible benefits and all these exciting possibilities which which actually do things which we can't do just in day to day life and and you know we can connect to people all around the planet at once which is incredible so how do we take the best of both worlds how do we get people functioning in society really well but empowered by positive connections you Absolutely. know to yeah and so we have in one last question i would have for you is that if you have your vision of the world come to fruition. You know, what, what are we looking at 10 years from now? What is this, you know, vision of humanity that you want to usher in from? So I, I, say, I see it as, um, you know, if we think about flow, the state of flow where we are interacting with other people, there's a rapport, um, and, and if we're creating something together or doing something like that, and there's this beautiful flow that's happening, like, for example, between jazz musicians, you know, somebody's, making up a, a sort of um, a theme and then passing it on and then it's coming back and forth and it's developing like that and we're, we're going into places which are really exploring new territory. Now, if we think about our interaction with other beings other than humans, like think about, say, interacting with a horse. If somebody's riding a horse, they are in a sense of flow, they're connected with another intelligence and and they work together to do things that neither could do separately. So, for example, when when you're you know riding a horse or you know you're maybe using a, a working dog to do something, these beings have more more strengths. That like a horse is so much stronger than we are and so much faster. So it's the combination of working together, taking advantage of the things that machines are going to be better than at, us at but with us in control, us in the loop. So that there's a, and I think this is really important to avoid, you know, all the sort of dystopian scenarios because we need to be in the loop and ultimately machines have to be trusted. We have to trust them. They have to work for us and in a way which is, is this, you know, 
basically contributes to our ability to create and cooperate. But they would be a part of every aspect of our lives at that point, these virtual beings. And, and they kind of, yeah, and I, I, I imagine there'll be assistance. And the, the, the key thing is you don't want a dependency. You don't want them there all the time. But you like some somebody that can help you when you need help, give you an alternate perspective. You know, I think, you know, probably the best thing that we can do for humanity is to have machines give you so many different points of view, you know, so that, I'm, you know, that, that you become aware of many different facets of what's going on. One of the other sort of exciting things that I think is that, you know, I mean, what we're trying to do is basically create a machine which can have experiences. And one of the, and then also connect that to language so that it can then talk about what it's doing. Because then you can actually have a conversation with a machine that's done something that no human could ever do. You know, this is what it's like to feel the internet all at once. Or this is what it's like to, view Saturn from a, you know, a satellite out there and, 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 and you can well, have that feel or something like that. And the machine can actually relate to you in a human type term, because when it starts relating in a way that we, we fundamentally understand, and these can be ex experiential sort of things rather than more abstract terminologies, then there becomes more of a visceral sense of, of, of understanding. So, I believe that we can get deeper understanding um, and you know we make sense of the world through like creating metaphors and things like that basically to simplify things but we these all boil down to experiences that we've had because that's what grounds the meaning and, and in truth we, we are uh, you know obviously what we feel is more important than what we know and you know I think there's a sense of that living in, through the world of experience, I think we're moving to that age versus the age of information, right? So I think that that definitely is where we're shifting. And this has been so inspiring. Again, Mark, thank you so much for the work you're doing. And I'm, I hope everyone here has a chance to check out the work you're doing personally. But um, thank you for being a part of this. Oh, thank you very much. Always a pleasure talking with you, Sherrod. Okay, take care, my friend. Yes, bye. This is Baby X. She's one of the most advanced brain simulations in the world, and she's enjoying playing a peekaboo game with me. So what is Baby X? It's a virtual infant simulation. It's trying to create the elements which put together aspects of what makes something lifelike. Baby X isn't an animation. She's a virtual human, and all of the behaviors are generated by neural networks. She watches and listens to what I do and makes her own decisions in real time about how to respond. If I teach her that this is a duck using associative learning, then something amazing happens that we do as well. We just take it completely for granted. Now watch what happens in Baby X's brain when I say the word duck to her. Duck. Her brain builds a link between the word duck and an actual duck we can see that Baby X is looking at the spider and there's no reaction. But I'm now going to tell her it's something she should be scared of. <sighs> Scary spider! The spider now provokes a clear fear response. The sight of the spider triggers specific parts of her brain. Her amygdala initiates a cascade of reactions which send chemicals into her system generating the physical and emotional feelings of fear. When we take the spider away, she calms down. And when we bring it back, we can see she's now scared of it. When Baby X presses the green button, a duck appears. And when she presses the red button, a snake appears. As Baby X continues to press the buttons, her brain begins to form new connections. She wants to see a duck, so she's working out pressing the green button gets her what she wants. This ability to learn sequences and to predict what might be about to happen next is crucial to everything we do. We all know that making eye contact is a powerful way to create a sense of connection. There's a chemical in your brain called oxytocin, the hug drug, which also has an amazing effect on how we connect with other people. I'm going to increase her levels of oxytocin and let's see what effect that has. Baby X makes a clear shift to focus on eye contact. We're connecting and she even gives me a smile. Inside Baby X's brain, we can see oxytocin being released. 
Here it's the greeny blue bits secreted by her pituitary gland. The simple act of connection means she's rewarded with oxytocin, which makes her seek even more connection. And even though I'm interacting with a digital baby, the same thing is happening inside my brain. 